Please welcome back Andrew Ross Sorkin and his guest, U.S. Treasury Secretary Janet Yellen. Thank you. Thank you so much for being here, Madam Secretary. Thanks uh, for the invitation. We are thrilled to have you, and there's so much to talk about um, in terms of where our economy is and where it's going, and questions about inflation and China and railroads and crypto and so, so much more. And so I just want to get into it. Before we even get into it, actually one of the questions I wanted to ask you is you're gonna stay in this job, right? I certainly plan to do so. I'm excited about um, the agenda that, well, I'm excited about what President Biden has accomplished so far. And I think there's more to come, but certainly carrying out um, all the work and, um, investments that are part of the CHIPS Act, right. the Inflation Reduction Act, the Infrastructure Act. Uh, we play uh, an but important role. But you know, there role. was a parlor game going on about whether you were gonna stay. Well, I'm committed to staying and- For the duration. I have no plan to, to leave, so. Okay, we'll, 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 go, we'll go back to that, I'm sure. But um, let me ask you this. Oh. We've been talking about inflation and where we really are. Um, but in the past couple of days, one of the newest concerns has been the zero COVID policy in China, yes. what we're seeing there, and what that could or could not do to supply chains right now, and how delicate that situation really is. So it certainly is a threat to the progress we've made on healing supply chain difficulties, and those have really contributed importantly to inflation. We've seen inventories rebuild, shipping costs have come down, uh, supplier delivery lags have come down. So um, the global economy, the US economy are healing and the COVID lockdowns we've seen have disrupted production in an important way But do you think it's gonna get worse? China. I, I can't make a forecast about what's going to happen in China but it is certainly a risk on the horizon. More complicated. Do you think the zero COVID policy is a good one? Well, it certainly led China now at this stage. I mean, China did well in terms of infections initially, but now I think China's in a difficult place. So I don't know what the right strategy is for China going forward. I'm not a public health expert. I'm not gonna give China advice but certainly there's a difficult situation that China faces in managing this. And we can see that their economy is slowing, perhaps to the point where it will really negatively impact the entire global outlook. Let me ask you, we, all of us I think are looking at supply chains as, as an issue that could impact inflation. The other piece of this is this rail, railroad strike. Yes. How big a deal, if you, if you put both of those things together, if you've, you've been saying for so long that no recession is coming, that we're gonna have, I think, a soft landing is how you've described it. I believe there is a path by which that can happen. There are risks around that path, but I believe that it's certainly possible for us to have a soft landing. How does the equation change, though, with what's happened over the last couple of days? Well, I think President Biden has made clear that it would be simply an unacceptable disruption to our economy um, to have a rail strike. And he met yesterday with the leadership of Congress um, and stressed the importance of finding a solution to this. Because when you think about um, the importance of rail shipments and pa passenger transportation as well, uh, the disruptions would certainly be very, very serious and a huge setback. Right. Here's an inflation question. So Jay Powell is gonna be talking in Washington later today. And one of the things he's trying to do, as you know, is to effectively slow things down. That is, that is the goal, as perverse as that may sound. What is a politically palatable unemployment number in this country? Meaning when you start to think longer term about how you actually get inflation down, Ostensibly, it also means that unemployment's gonna go up. But what is reasonable and what's unreasonable? Well, right now we have almost the lowest unemployment rate we've had in 50 years. And by some measures, if you look at the ratio of job openings 
to people seeking work, that ratio is higher than it's been since we've been collecting the relevant data to measure it. So we have a very hot job market. Of, of course, the economy has slowed. Um, that was to be expected when President Biden right. was elected. You know, unemployment was close to 7%. We had a very rapid recovery, um, I think thanks to the policies he's put in effect. But um, we don't want to overshoot um, full employment, and we do have an inflation problem. So you would expect growth to slow, and it has slowed. Right. So we're continuing to grow. We have positive growth, but it slowed substantially. We still have a strong labor market. And look, what you, you're seeing is some writing down of expectations for future growth that is inducing firms right. to rethink how many people they really need to hire. So we've seen the beginnings of um, job openings beginning to just fall off a little bit. We're certainly not seeing so major when, when do you think we see that, though? I mean, we're, you know, we're going to have a number of CEOs here who have actually just cut staff. So Meta, Amazon, a lot of big companies are starting to do this. But when do you think you're going to start to see those in the numbers? And again, is 4%? Do you think a number that is quote unquote politically palatable, four and a half percent? What, what, where do you, when you sort of project and talk, it, talk inside your own office, what's, what's the so conversation? I, I'm not sure what the right number is, but um, certainly historically we would have considered numbers with unemployment in the fours to be a very healthy labor market. Um, most people who write down estimates of what is full employment what is the unemployment rate that goes with that, um, would say that an unemployment right. rate in the fours is healthy. So, um, you know, perhaps, look, I, I think we can make a lot of progress in um, the labor market just on the hiring, hiring intention side, right. job opening side. I don't think it's necessary to see very substantial layoffs. The tech sector is special. They have been hit. Um, in a slowing economy, declining ad revenue, and then of course they um, benefited massively from the boom in technology during the pandemic. So I think there are some right. special factors that are affecting that sector. But the U.S. economy is slowing down, but it's, it's operating at a very healthy level. And look, consumers remain in good shape. Their finances are healthy. Um, banks are hel in a healthy right. state. What, what numbers, what data, metrics do you look at on a daily basis to try to figure out where things are? I, I What's the most at, important thing? I look at all the data, but um, you know, it's a habit that's for me left over I know. From, from Fed days. But um, certainly I look at numbers pertaining to the job market and probably the right. employment report um, we'll get one on Friday, is probably the single most important report along with inflation. Along with inflation you data. just mentioned something that made me think of a personal question for you, which is, do you feel you have more influence and power in this job, or you had more influence and power in the job at the Fed? They're, they're totally different jobs. And um, I love the job at the Fed. Um, you have an enormous amount of influence, the people in that room. But a lot really of people say the Fed right now is, is, is controlling, to some degree, the economy, even more than, than, than anyone in, in the world of politics, per se. You think that's right? In terms of the overall outlook for the economy yep. and um, the progress of inflation in the job market, um, the, the Fed probably has a more important right. role than any other single thing, but many things influence the course of the economy, whether it's the progress of Russia's brutal war against Ukraine, um, COVID lockdowns right. in China, um, lo you know, lots of things have play a role, but the Fed, of course, is important. It's their job right. to um, make sure to, well, to pursue both maximum employment and price stability um, jointly. Since you've sat in that role before, what do you think about the fact that members of Congress now um, publicly ridicule, complain about the Fed? 
What do you think about that? I think it's part of the job, and the Fed has to ignore. Um, well, it, it needs to understand what people think about what it's doing, because there's maybe very, very important information in that. But the Fed is a professional, non-political organization, and it's filled with trained, competent people who are trying to make their best judgments about what policy course is best for the U.S. economy, and they need to stay right. focused on that goal. And I, I, my experience has been that they do that they do exactly that. Two more inflation questions, and then I, I'm, I'm going I'm to move on. I promise. One is um, when you think about trying to tame inflation, given the seat you're in. How do you think about lifting, for example, tariffs on China? How do you think about, for example, modifying you know, green cards and immigration policies for skilled labor? Wouldn't that help? Well, we have certainly tried to play a complementary role. So I think the way I look at inflation is the primary task falls to the Fed, but we want to do things that also contribute to um, easing cost of living pressures on households. Right. We've looked at tariffs. And look, the, these tariffs on China were imposed because of unfair trade practices that still exist. Um, it would have some impact on prices or inflation on a one-shot right. basis. But one should not overestimate what impact um, lowering the right. tariffs would have. I mean, a tenth or two on inflation probably. So you think not Most enough? people would not notice it in a major way in their daily lives. It does go right. in the right direction. Look, what we've done, what President Biden has done, is use the strategic oil releases from the strategic petroleum reserve to hold down the prices of gas when they skyrocketed. The Inflation Reduction Act um, is going to lower drug prices. Insulin prices are going to come down to no more than $35 a month. Um, Health care premium prices are going to be held down. And um, the Inflation Reduction Act also, uh, starting right. next year, people are going to be able to get rebates for energy efficient appliances for electric heat pumps that they install in their right. homes, insulation and the like. Let me ask you a related question. Biden's going to be talking about, with Macron tomorrow. This actually relates to the Inflation uh, Reduction Act because it, it, it deals with um, the idea of industrial policy. As you know, some of the Europeans are very unhappy about our industrial policy because it may impact their ability to sell vehicles and other things here in the US in a price competitive way. There's been something that we've all talked about since the pandemic called friends shoring, yes. right? Which is yeah, to say I've that, about that too. right? You've talked about friends shoring. I have. Well, this is not that friendly. Well, look, I, it 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 is reasonably friendly. Um, we are concerned about over dependence on China um, and Russia to right. some extent for critical um, supplies. Uh, especially for electric vehicles. We're highly dependent on China for most of the minerals that go into making batteries. And obje an objective of the Inflation Reduction Act is to um, have more supply, s adequate supply chains among our friends, our trading right. partners. So um, a requirement of that act is that to qualify for the uh, portion of right. the credit, it's necessary that the minerals come from or be processed in um, trade partners that um, are our friends, and that is a form of friendshoring. I'm going to pivot the conversation. Let's talk crypto for a second, because okay. you and I have talked crypto for a long time, and I, I don't know if I'm, I'm projecting onto you, but I thought you were very skeptical of crypto. I have been skeptical. As I have been. I've been and then there was a period of time where I thought, you know, as this train seemed like it was leaving the station, I think a lot of us who were so skeptical thought, are we making a mistake? Is there something real to this? What's happening here? And I was sensing from you a little bit of, oh, well, maybe we actually have to figure out what this thing is, because maybe the whole thing actually is real. I don't know. Well, Where are you now in light of SBF? 
So I have been skeptical, and I remain quite skeptical. But um, I will say, look, uh, we have to be open to financial innovation. Um, financial innovations can bring benefits. We know, for example, that cross-border transactions are expensive and time-consuming. Um, some transactions we make are more expensive than they would ideally be. And in terms of financial inclusion, a significant right. share of the population um, doesn't really have access to affordable financial services. So to the extent that the crypto world could deliver um, faster, right. cheaper, cheaper, safer um, transactions, we should be open to financial innovation. That said, that's not what most of it has been about. And I have strongly believed and continue to believe, and I think everything we've lived through over the last couple of weeks, but earlier as well, says this is an industry that really needs to have adequate f right. regulation, and it doesn't. But here's the regulatory question. If you don't believe in the underlying thing, and the underlying thing is living in this global universe that's oftentimes offshore, how does it work well, to regulate it onshore? Well, we certainly need to work with our allies. Um, and we are involved in global discussions. Um, and the Financial Action right. Task Force um, is involved Were in- Were you surprised about this whole Sam Bankman Fried of it? Well, of course, I was surprised. It's not, it's not something that um, I expected to happen. But look, you know, I've worked with other regulators through the Financial Stability Oversight Council and President Biden um, ordered a comprehensive look at regulatory right. holes. We've put out five or six reports on where the holes are. Um, our, our first report, the President's Working Group on Financial Markets, we put out a report on problems with stable coins which are cryptocurrencies right. that aim for a fixed relationship to the right. dollar or another currency, and said, you know, this is an area where there are significant regulatory uh, concerns and the possibility right. of the equivalent of bank runs. The ink was barely dry on that report, and what happened, we saw a run on Terra and Lunar, right. and Tether, which is w one of the larger Stable coins also broke the buck and say, look, you want an object lesson? These things can happen. Look, it just it just happened. And we more recent reports have pointed to a broad range of concerns. So protection of customer assets, segregation of customer assets. If you put funds in a brokerage firm and trade in the right. equity markets, you can be assured your customer funds are but safe. But you're telling the American public you should be allowed to trade crypto, you shouldn't, you shouldn't, you should be allowed, but you shouldn't do it? What, what are you telling them? Well, it's a, well, we, we want to make sure that they, um, they have adequate customer right. protections that we require in every other regulated how, exchange. How worried are you about the lobbying? In, information. How about worried about you, the lobbying that's gone on with crypto? And, and by the way, Sam Bankman fried was a major Democratic donor, as you know. You, you didn't ever meet with him, did you? I've never met no. with him. Um, I, think uh, I, will, I think I won't begin right now either, so. Uh, <laughs> um, I asked the question, though, because I think there's a lot of people in the, in the, in the public who say, what's going on here? And wh whether there's too much, too much money sloshing around, too much influence peddling. Well, there is influence peddling in a lot of different areas, and so that you know, money certainly does influence politics and the ability to regulate. And crypto is certainly a good, good example of that. Um, look, we, we have consistently urged right. that regulatory gaps be closed. And I think this experience with his, his firm or set of firms just couldn't provide a better illustration. Um, the, you know, these are very risky assets. The, the good piece of an explosion like we saw is that it hasn't spilled over to the banking sector. Banking regulators have been very careful you don't think that about the, crypto. This is, there's no Lehman moment here for you. 
It's a Lehman moment within crypto, and crypto is big enough that you've had substantial harm of investors, right. and particularly people who aren't very well informed right. about the risk that they're undertaking. And that, that's, right. that's a very bad thing. Let me move to a different topic. Um, Elon Musk, I imagine his name's gonna come up a couple of times today. Um, you've got a Twitter account? Excuse you've got a Twitter account? I, well, I do, yes, I do. Do you like it? Um, we, I have, as, as Secretary of the Treasury, um, a Twitter account in which I remark on things that um, my agency is doing. And um, yeah, but most, most government officials do. So there, there was two questions I wanted to ask you about this. One is, I don't, and you've talked a lot about competition. And you have often said there's too little competition. One of the things that he's complained about in the past couple of days is the idea that Apple and Google are these massive platforms that he thinks are potentially going to control his ability to pursue what he thinks is free speech. We can debate that. I'm actually curious what you think of that, that the free speech piece, but also the platform piece. Well, so I generally think that competition is a good thing in the economy. And one of the first things that President Biden did was ask his whole administration to um, look at ways to promote competition. Right. We saw um, uh, just a couple of weeks ago, hearing aids finally are now on sale without a doctor's right. prescription. It's gonna save consumers an awful lot of money. So I'm in favor of it. But what it. about phones? So, I mean, something, something like um, Twitter has network externalities. And because it's a network, it tends to, um, it's very hard. People gravitate to it. The more, the more used it is, the more other people gravitate to communicating through that. It's hard for competition to right. prevail. And I, I think it's a good thing if Apple is looking at the content. Look, most broadcast, um, broadcast stations are, um, you know, subject to standards in terms of um, what they broadcast to the public. And Twitter's not really that different um, than other broadcast stations. So, so you stations. think it's good if the, if, if the platforms are, are, are overseeing well, some it, of what's on it? It is, it is a kind of control that I think is, is needed. Um, let me ask you one other uh, Elon of it, which was this, and this just happened a couple weeks ago. Maybe you can explain what happened. The president said, quote, Elon Musk's cooperation and or technical relationships with other countries is worthy of being looked at. Whether or not he's doing anything inappropriate, I'm not suggesting that. I'm suggesting it's worth being looked at, and that's all I'll say. Then a couple of days later, you said, we're not looking at it. Well, let what me, happened? Let, let me clarify. Yeah. I misspoke, and um, let me say, to the extent that there are international investments there. Um, it are, we have an agency within Treasury called CFIUS that um, does look at transactions uh, that involve foreign investment in the United States to see if they um, create national security And this risks. relates to, to Saudi being invested to some degree in Twitter? Or does this relate to? So, I'm not, I'm not going to talk, we, we do not talk about particular transactions, but this agency does look carefully at transactions that could pose right. risks. And does that mean you're still looking if at it this? does, I, I'm not going to say specifically what we are or aren't looking at. We don't, we don't comment right. on work that's in progress. But if there are such risks, it would be appropriate for, CIP, right. for CFIUS to have a look. We're gonna run out of time, so I have two, two, three more real quick questions. Um, TikTok, how concerned are you? We're gonna have the CEO of TikTok here later today. There are a lot of people who think that TikTok should be banned in the United States. Well, it's a national security concern. That, that's something that's a case, case in progress. Um, but do you th are, how concerned are you? I, I think there are legitimate national security concerns. We will talk to him about that uh, in just a little bit. Um, I want to ask you a big hypothetical, because we're going to be talking to uh, the president of Ukraine in just a moment. But it, it, one of the things people say about Ukraine is that it could become a dress rehearsal for the way China may behave with Taiwan. And I wonder about all of the American multinational companies that do business in China today and what you think about the risk. You know, because when, when the war with Russia began, most US businesses left Russia. But it wasn't the hardest economic choice to make, because it was oftentimes a small part of their business. 
If, in fact, China were to try to take Taiwan, it would be very difficult for some of the big Starbuckses and Apples and others that have made major investments in China to do that. What do you think, the, what, what would happen? So look, I don't want to play out a hypothetical. Our China policy, we um, adhere to a one China policy. We um, feel very strongly and have communicated to the Chinese that um, we wish to see peaceful relationships between Taiwan and China and peace in the Taiwan Straits right. and that it's extremely important. So um, this is something I certainly would not want to see happen. But we are seeing a range of geopolitical risks um, rise to prominence right. and it's appropriate for American businesses to be thinking about what those risks are. Um, we have national security risks with respect to some practices in China, risk with respect to supply chains, and American businesses are really beginning to think about that more seriously and, and should. But look, we, I expect, certainly hope and expect that there um, will continue to be very strong ties between China and the United States when it comes to mutually beneficial trade and investment. And this is not something that I think would be beneficial either to the United States or to China or to the global economy um, to, see, to see a road. Uh, we are over time, so this is a final question for you. You bet. Um, and I was uh, reading, uh, John Hilsenrath has written a fabulous book uh, about uh, the Treasury Secretary that I was reading uh, last evening, and I, I wanted to read you something, uh, because something that has been said about you is that you are always prepared, always prepared. Um, and this is oh. what was written. While studying at Yale, a classmate had invited her, that's you, to a party where she was told people would be smoking marijuana. Yellen had never done such a thing before and decided she should practice smoking before the party. Well, I want to be prepared. <laughs> she bought a pack of cigarettes by inhaling and uh, tried inhaling and was quickly hooked on nicotine, which I'm now told you're not anymore. Uh, June 26, 1976, last pack of cigarettes I ever smoked. I threw them in a dumpster. It, um, Kennedy Airport as I boarded a plane for, uh, for France, and I have not smoked a cigarette since. But I did smoke three packs a day for a while. That was um, an unfortunate um, side effect of my preparation for that party. <laughs> the Treasury Secretary, everybody, thank you so very, very, very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.